Hey everyone, I'm Christy McClellan, and I want to invite you to join me for my new Bible study, Luke in the Land. Over seven sessions, we'll journey through Israel and teaching videos that take place in places like the Sea of Galilee, the Jordan River, the Mount of Olives, and even Jerusalem. As we study snapshots from Luke in the places where the events took place, we'll learn the important historical and cultural context that reframes and enriches familiar accounts of Jesus's life. Join me as we walk together and encounter the living God who is better than we ever knew. Learn more at lifeway.com slash Luke in the land. This is the Marked Podcast from Lifeway Women. Each episode, we'll talk about what God is doing, how He has and is marking each of us. We're so glad you've joined us today. Hello and welcome to the Marked Podcast. I'm Elizabeth Heineman and I am here at the Southern Baptist Convention. So you may hear some background noise with Donna Gaines. Hello, Donna. Hi, Elizabeth. We are so excited to have you. I mentioned before we started recording that as soon as I said, we're recording at SBC, everybody was like, Donna Gaines, you need to make sure you talk to Donna Gaines. And so I'm so excited to get to talk to you today. Why don't we start and you just tell us about yourself, about your ministry, and just about your family, all the all the about you stuff. (laughs) Thank you. I am a pastor's wife. Steve is the pastor of Bellevue Baptist Church in Memphis. Mm -hmm. And we he has been a pastor now for 41 years. Hard to believe when our son was six weeks old, he became a pastor at 25. We look back and think it's hard to believe people actually trusted you to be a pastor (laughs) at 25. Um, But they it was a very gracious church, and we have loved the ministry. That's Absolutely awesome. love it. Have four children. They're all grown and married, and we have 18 grandchildren. Wow. That uh, is some fun holiday gathering. It is gathering, fun. We just I'm a week sure. before last spent a week together at the beach with everybody. Oh, my goodness. And <laughs> How many houses wonderful. do you have to have? Actually, for one. <laughs> okay. But it does have nine bedrooms. Wow. Okay. <laughs> one for each of the adults and four bunk rooms. There you go. And in 2019, all four of our children had boys. They're oh, all turning wow. five this year, and they shared a bunk room. Oh, that's Talk so fun. Talk about some funny fun. conversations. Oh, standing sure. outside the door and listening to them. <laughs> yes. And of course, they were the first ones up every morning. <laughs> yes, of course. And they're like best friends they for are. life. I'm so sure. Cute. That's so, so cute. fun. <laughs> That's so fun. Well, we wanted to talk to you for many reasons because you are um, leading in your church. You're also leading in your community. And that's one thing that we really wanted to talk to you about is your Arise to Read program. So tell us about that program and how you became involved and what it does. I'm an educator in background, Uh Um, but I also, through our Bellevue Loves Memphis projects, Mm -hmm. um, going into the inner city and doing projects with our church, started going into Binghampton Christian Academy in the Binghampton area of Memphis, Mm -hmm. and this is an academy that is... um, it's a faith-based school, mm-hmm. but it's and it's donor-funded. Okay. And they minister to inner-city children and refugee children. Okay. And there was actually a dorm that 14 girls lived in, and mm-hmm. a dorm for 14 boys. And these were the most at-risk students. Okay. That lived there Monday through Friday morning, and then they uh-huh. would go home on the weekend. So I started taking teenage girls down there on Tuesday afternoon to work with the girls uh-huh. and help them with their homework, okay. with literacy. We would set goals for them, mm-hmm. academic goals, give them rewards when they achieve those. Yes. And so after four years of doing that and seeing these girls just blossom with the relationships, but also improve academically. I was praying over the city. Mm. I just read Wes Stafford's book, Too Small to Ignore. He's the former CEO of Compassion International. And he said, if you want to break the generational poverty cycle, whether it's a third world country or the inner city, Mm. it's going to take the gospel and education. So I was literally praying over the city in the summer of 2012 Mm -hmm. and asking the Lord, God, I'm seeing these, these girls blossom but we have so many children. Memphis has one of the highest child poverty rates in oh, the nation. Wow. Okay. And knowing I'm to love my neighbors, I love myself. Right. I can't rest knowing there are children who have such great needs. Mm. Literally praying. And it felt like the Holy Spirit just enveloped me with his presence. And the words that were impressed upon my heart that morning were, this is your city. 
these are your children. Mm. What are you doing about it? And actually, Neil, before an ottoman, at that time it was in my great room that I would meet with the Lord, and I rocked back on my heels and answered out loud. Wow. <laughs> so, Lord, I don't know. It feels yes. really overwhelming. Yeah. I don't even know where to start. And immediately it was like, get churches to adopt inner city schools mm. and focus on literacy and the gospel. Yeah. So contacted our... It, it was a retired principal who was mm-hmm. working with our missions department. She was our liaison between the church and the school system yeah. and said, Sarah, would you contact the volunteer coordinator and tell her what we're wanting to do? Mm-hmm. And so she did. And her response was, you're not going to believe this. My mandate from the board is to increase the number of faith-based organizations that adopt schools. Oh, wow. <laughs> so God had just blown the door open. And yeah. you know, since that time, we started with a pilot school mm-hmm. and we used the 1,000 word Fry Sight Word list, okay. which is very easy to train volunteers to do. It's not yeah. Phonics, nobody has to be intimidated right, by it. Right, right. But these are, in fact, the first 300 words uh-huh. comprise 67% of the vocabulary that elementary school children encounter oh, wow. in class. Yeah. So if they can know them with what we call automaticity without mm-hmm. having to think or decode, it helps comprehension because okay. they're not having to focus on these words. So we train volunteers to go in for one hour a day, okay. uh, a week rather, and they will work with two children. So Elizabeth, you go on Tuesday, uh-huh. and maybe you go at 10 o'clock on Tuesday, and right. you have two students, and you will work 30 minutes with the first one and 30 minutes with the second one. Okay. And then I come on Thursday, and I'm also volunteering an hour, and I will get your, other, your same two students and have 30 minutes. Okay. So the child gets one hour of one-on-one. Mm-hmm. working on sight word fluency, but also comprehension. The last five to six minutes is spent with them reading and answering right. comprehension questions. We see these children average a three and a half grade level increase wow. in sight word fluency in one year. Yeah. So it makes a tremendous impact. And obviously once we did our pilot school, principals talk. Yes. <laughs> and now we, we're having a struggle filling all of their requests. Okay. We were in 42 schools in Memphis wow. Shelby County schools this past year with over 800 volunteers. That's awesome. Yeah, yeah we were talking about volunteering and how um, important it is, yes. but a lot of times people have a hard time figuring out how to get plugged in um, and how to, maybe their thing is not reading, right. maybe their thing is something else. And we were talking about um, similar programs in the area. I volunteer at a, a organization that is a parachurch organization mm-hmm. similar to Arise to Read where I help adults pass a uh, high school equivalency yes. exams. Doing their GEDs. And then, yes, yes, that's great. Yes. And then also English language learning yes. is oh, another yeah. big thing. And mm-hmm. so um, the way that I got involved, I was just going to tell this story real quick yes. because I think it's a common story for a lot of people is I went on a mission trip and we practice part of our mission journey that that week was to help practice English with students. And I really loved doing that. I thought this was so fun. And the other women that were on the mission trip were like, you also are really good at it. They're like, there's not, we, we were okay at it. We struggled, but we could see that you were good at this. Mm -hmm. And so that kind of confirmed to me like, oh, I'm just like naturally gifted this way. And also I really enjoy it. So Mm -hmm. I came back and, and asked my missions minister at my church. I was like, Hey, where can I do this here? Because I would rather do it here every week rather than one week a year. And so I just think about, I have friends that volunteer with student, um, ministries Mm -hmm. outside the church. I have friends that volunteer with feeding the hungry. I have friends that volunteer with people who are homeless, helping them find jobs. And so whatever you're like passionate about, but also whatever is fun for you. I think there are so many opportunities that are fun for you or that you're just naturally gifted in, or maybe you have a skill set that you've learned through your job. Like I think about Habitat for Humanity. Yes. The people that are like very skilled in Mm -hmm. building things. Right. Um, And it may be fun for them to do that on the side. And so um, what are some tips that you have for women who are like, I really want to get involved in volunteering outside of my church maybe because maybe their church doesn't do something inside the church mm-hmm. what are, what tips do you have for women to uh, find you know, obviously this? I think it's crucial to serve at your church yes, and then to serve right. out as well because right. we're Christ ambassadors and as talk we'll a little bit about that community. too why is it important to serve both in and outside your church well it, I think we need to raise our children to do the same too, yes. because we are servants. We follow the right. man who said, I didn't come to be served, but to serve right. and to give my life as a ransom for many. Mm-hmm. So we give our lives away mm-hmm. and that's how we find it. Yes. Um, it you know, it's that upside down kingdom right. that, that we serve, the kingdom of the Lord. And so as we serve the church, then God commissions us to go out and take what we're doing in the church out into the community mm-hmm. where the lost are, where the broken right. are, where right. there are such great needs. And Jesus said, if we love him with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength, we will 
we'll love our neighbor as we love ourselves. I know that we're commanded to do that. But what happens when we love God with our entire being is he fills us with his love and then we love our neighbor. Yes. And if if you're loving... Because let's just be honest, it would be impossible for us to love our neighbors without Without the Holy Spirit. Yes. Absolutely. Absolutely. What? To love a lot of people. Right. (laughs) Yes. Our neighbors, our fellow church members. Sometimes our relatives. Sometimes our own family. (laughs) Yes, exactly. But the Lord fills us. And when he meets our greatest need Mm -hmm. for love and significance, which that's only met in our relationship with Jesus. So when he fills me and I can know that I know I am genuinely loved and eternally significant, Mm -hmm. I'm able to love people out of the overflow without demanding anything from them. And if I'm to love my neighbor as I love myself, I can tell you, Elizabeth, I would not be able to sleep at night if I thought my grandchildren were going to bed hungry Mm. or were getting a subpar education. So how can I go to sleep at night knowing there are children in my city Mm -hmm. who are going to bed hungry and who are not getting a good education? And if children are not reading proficiently by the end of fourth grade, Mm -hmm. two thirds, two thirds of them are going to end up either on welfare or in prison. Wow. I'm responsible for that. Yeah. I'm responsible if I'm in my city for making sure that children have an opportunity to not end up as a statistic. Yes. So I encourage women, find. A, there are so many parachurch organizations, right. so many churches doing ministries now in their local communities. Mm-hmm. We, Our missions department calls them pathways. So like we that. provide all kinds of pathways mm-hmm. for people to get involved. If you want to do a weekly involvement, like with the Rise to Read, it's one right. hour a week. Right. Anybody can do that. Mm-hmm. And the beauty is, as we've begun to do it, now businesses are coming on board and yes. they're underwriting the cost of supporting a school and then letting their employees go and volunteer one hour a week. Oh, because awesome. they, mm-hmm. many of them have policies to give back into the community. Yes. And we're able to basically sell it right. by telling them you're educating your future workforce. Yes, exactly. <laughs> and keeping them out of crime. Yes. And off the streets. So, That's so um, great. yes, I just encourage if you will pray, God will open a door. I love that. Um, how can people get involved in a rise to read if yes. they're because you're. <clears throat> You're in Memphis. Are you outside of Memphis we as well? We are. We're actually okay. in 14 states and three foreign countries. Wow. Oh, wow. <laughs> we became a nonprofit in 2015 because we started in the fall of 13. Mm-hmm. And literally, as I said, once we started our pilot school, then principals started talking and they realized, wait, these volunteers will come in. And yes. we just tell the principal, we don't. Principals are overworked, over mandated, yes. stressed. Mm-hmm. So if you come in and say, we want you to do one more thing, mm-hmm. they're going to go, uh uh-uh. uh. No right. capacity for that. Right. But if you come in and say, look, we want to come and serve you. Mm-hmm. If you will give us a space and second grade children, okay. we will work with them on yeah. reading fluency um, and help them improve in reading and comprehension. Mm-hmm. And we will be basically invisible. Not only that, we do two teacher appreciation meals for each Love of the schools that, that we adopt. Mm-hmm. And then periodically we put things in the teacher's lounge, mm-hmm. words of encouragement, just to let them know, we see how hard you're working. We recognize that these children are coming in so far behind and you have 20 to 24 children right. in a classroom. You cannot work with them one-on-one. Right. And so not only does it improve reading fluency mm-hmm. scores, reading scores, but it improves just morale yes. in, the, in the school yes. because people are coming alongside them and saying, we see you and we want to come alongside you and yeah. serve you. And we've had principal after principal tell us there are organizations that come in and they do a one-time thing mm-hmm. or they're here for just a, you know, a year, but then they're gone. Right. But we come back year after year after year. Oh. Um, go to arise number two read.org. Okay. And you can find out all about us. You can contact us. Um, we do trainings. We yeah. help people get live workbooks up. We do pre-testing and post-testing so mm-hmm. that we know yeah. how well the children are doing. And this past year, I'm forgetting the exact number of schools. Last year it was 10 schools, but we enlarged it where we, we don't tutor or coach all of the second graders. Mm-hmm. We do the ones that are kind of most at risk, right? Um, but we pre-tested and post-tested in several of the schools, all of the second graders, uh-huh. so we could contrast the children in the program versus those out to see right. how they had improved. And obviously the children in the program far surpassed those who were just in the classroom because yeah. nothing beats that one-on-one attention. Right. Um, and encouragement. And we watch the children blossom and discipline problems go down in the classroom. Mm-hmm. So, you know, it's yes. a win-win. I um, was telling you too, that my church like adopts a couple, yes. we now have yes. two elementary schools in our area. And I think that's another thing that churches can do yes. um, if, if they do their Rise to Read program, but also like in, in addition to that, but also if they can't get that off the ground in their city just yet, just adopting in an elementary school and kind of yes. like you were saying, um, being there the whole year, yes. year after year, we adopted the ones that are closest to our church building. Exactly. Um, yeah. And I think we do we do things like that, like help with lunch times, help mm-hmm. with um, 
when the kids are on break, providing meals for yes. those who may not have mm-hmm. a meal otherwise. Mm-hmm. Coats, we do right. all those things. Yes. And teacher help as yes. well. Um, we've gone in and painted classrooms. Yes. We've helped set up things. Landscaping, we've, we've done it all. All yes. the things, yes. Well, and what's so fun is it changes the volunteers as much as it changes yes. the children because the volunteers fall in love with the kids. Because I right. tell them before they were just a statistic, they're a number. Mm-hmm. Now they have a name and a face yes. and you fall in love with them. Yeah. And then the volunteers come out and say, we want to do more. Can we provide uniforms? Can we provide food what else can we do for the school and so several of our schools especially our pilot school just immediately they're wanting to do a clothes closet so we did a clothes drive and they and one of the men went up there was a the guidance counselor had a closet but it didn't have a door and Mm. lock on it so he literally put a door and a lock on it built shelves in there put all the clothing in there we did a women's event where their entrance for the ticket was a pair of children's tennis shoes oh and that's a way to get your women's ministry involved it is and so then we took those tennis shoes and donated them to the school that's a great idea. Um, yes, yeah, so for children who don't have shoes. So there's yes. so many fun and creative things you can do right. that give women an opportunity to serve and minister. Yes. My pastor has always said, and I know that this is not original to him, but if he always says, if our church suddenly went away, yes. I want the community to know that Absolutely. and to feel that loss. Yes. Not saying that we want to go away and feel no. that, but we want to be so involved in the community right. and to be so supportive of We're the community. We're to be salt and light. We're right. to change the culture around exactly. us. Exactly. That yeah. if we were to go away, they would notice and Absolutely. be and mourn that loss yes. because we are doing so many good things for them. Yes. And so that love is, that. yes. And I know that's not original to him. There have been many pastors that have said that, but I think but that's a that good heart. radar yes, it is. to, um, to think about is w- if your church w- were to go away, would yes. they notice in the yeah. elementary school? Would they notice? Right. Um, and so that's a beautiful thing. Thank you so much for all that you do in oh, that my goodness. It's area. A delight. And you're such an encouragement for others to volunteer as well. well. And I still coach once a week as well. I love it. I love it. <laughs> <laughs> so you have to love little, doing it. Yes, yes I do. I love doing it. And in fact, one my little boy this past mm-hmm. year, this sounds crazy, but he completed the 1,000 words. And that's wow. basically a ninth grade. Yeah, that's a awesome. sideward fluency level because it's basically 100 words per grade. Okay. And comprehending, he's reading chapter books. I yes. mean, he just, and then I had a little Hispanic uh, girl whose parents only speak Spanish. And so oh, wow. obviously learning English, not only was she learning to read, but right. learning a new language. Right. And she just did fabulous as well. So that's it's, so oh, it's just, there's nothing like it. And let's just be real. Second graders are oh, so much fun. Yes. <laughs> and you watch them light up. One yes. of the things that we tell our volunteers is a lot of these children don't have responsible adults right. who show up for them every week. Right. And we want you to be responsible. If you choose to volunteer, unless you're sick or you have to go out of town uh-huh. and we provide substitutes, right. we want you to be here every week because you develop a relationship with that child. Mm-hmm. And we watch them light up when they see yes. their coach. They, they so come fun. running in the classroom to get yes. started. They're so excited. I love that. Well, we want to shift the conversation just a little bit because um, something else that you're passionate about is Bible literacy. Yes. So not just like literacy and learning to read, yes. but also building biblical literacy. Yes. Tell us a little bit about how you have um, encouraged women. First of all, let's define the term biblical literacy, and then tell us how you encourage women to be biblically literate. Hey there, it's Priscilla Shire, and I wanted to take an opportunity to invite you to one of the highlights of my year, and I think it'll be one of the highlights of yours as well. On August the 24th, We'll have the Going Beyond Live event, but on that day, it will be simulcasted, which means I'll just come to wherever you are. You can be in the comfort of your own home or at your local church or gathered together in some space with a group of friends or on your own. And together, we can worship God in spirit and in truth, be taught from his word, hear the voice of God, pray with one another. It's such an incredible opportunity for us to be gathered together virtually with other people from different walks of life, different denominations, different time zones, different races, different backgrounds, all coming together under the name of Jesus Christ. Would you mark August 24th on your calendar, wherever in the world you live, and I'll look forward to joining with you then. Being biblically literate is 
having read the Word of God to the point that you know it, and you have a lens for viewing life. Mm. So it impacts and changes your worldview. We yeah. want women to have a biblical worldview. We want everybody to. And right. that's part of what, even with the Rise to Read, is teaching the children to read, because if they can't read, they can never read God's Word. Right, right. And we have an evangelism director mm -hmm. that puts Bible clubs on the campuses of the schools, and every child who comes to Bible club gets their own Bible. I love it. And we want them to have that. But I, I teach through the Bible um, and our, our women's ministry at our church. Mm -hmm. I also disciple women in my home, and I utilize um, a chronological Bible. Yes. So we read through the Bible chronologically, and we use the 14 eras or time periods of Scripture okay. that some of our missionaries use when mm -hmm. they do storying on the okay. field. And the curriculum I use was actually developed by former IMB missionaries, okay. um, chronologicalbibleteaching.com. But we, we actually then dig down into specific stories in scripture as we work through chronologically yes. and look at the number one question you always ask is what is God revealing about himself? Mm -hmm. Because we have a tendency to flip the a Bible open right. and go, what's for me? Right. Exactly. <laughs> We're yes. so self-centered. Yes. And instead we need to be asking God, what are you revealing about yourself? Mm -hmm. And then what does the Bible reveal about mankind? Right. Because we have not changed. Right. Satan still tempts us in the same ways, <laughs> From the garden because yes. it works. Yes, yes. <laughs> and so, what do we learn about what do we learn about sin? And then, mm. where have we seen this before? So you're making connections and seeing that God really is the same. Right. Yesterday, today, and forever, mm. He has not changed. The God of the Old Testament is the God of the New. Right. And everything in the Old points to the New, and Jesus is the fulfillment of all of it. Yes. And I tell my women in discipleship, I want you to be able to tell the story of the Bible in three minutes three hours or three days I love because it. we have gone on mission trips. Yes. Uh, and in fact, the first one that we went on, I went with Iva May, who was the founder of, mm -hmm. she and her husband of the Chronological Bible Teaching Curriculum. And we were in New Delhi and then we went to Tanzania and we did women's conferences. And in New Delhi, we had almost 400 women and they were from all over Northern India. And we spent three days teaching them the eras of the Bible. And we, at the end, had the women come up and share what they were taking home. And mm -hmm. we gave them, we had their symbol for each of the eras so okay. they can have the symbol because pictures transcend language. Right, right. And we knew that we could use them anywhere. Mm -hmm. So they, they have the, the symbols and they're able mm -hmm. to tell the story. And we had a woman from Northern India who was illiterate mm -hmm. that was at the conference and she came up there weeping. Wow. And she said, I can't read the Bible, mm -hmm. but now I know God's story and I can go back and tell yes. my people God's I story. I love that. <laughs> And that reminds me just of, you know, the old cathedrals and churches in Europe with the stained glass yes. and how those told, the, I mean, the those were the story of That's scripture right. for the people who That's could right. not read. That's right. Um, and so I think... I always like I kind of nerd out a little bit about art and architecture oh, and things like awesome. that because it is so beautiful and such a um, a way to depict the gospel in pictures and so I love that you have that um, we have a Bible study called Seamless which yes. is uh, by yes. Angie Smith absolutely Very and it good. also uses yes. those icons at the bottom mm -hmm. to help tell the story and I heard somebody here at the SBC yesterday telling her friend about it and she oh. was like so you can have these icons and she said our women all learn to tell the story of the yes. Bible through these, like, just as reminders, because they right. did the study, yes. but then they, as reminders, had those icons yes. to help you can teach your children. Yes, I With love these it. pictures as well. It's and, beautiful way to and tell them. right now, eras are really having a moment <laughs> with yes, Taylor Swift's tour. <laughs> oh, that's funny. <laughs> so I love that we've now, uh, that's right. we're, we're becoming very relevant <laughs> with the Bible eras. Um, no, I, that's really cool that you do that and have that uh, liter biblical literacy. Yeah. I think your definition is so perfect in such a succinct way of talking about biblical literacy. Um, and I know with the chronological Bible, my so my church is reading through the chronological bible this year awesome we're, our church is doing we've done it once before we're doing it again in 2025 okay yeah. and we are loving it and we're having Super. those conversations yes. of oh i didn't realize that this story happened and then this story happened and that's why this psalm is here exactly. <laughs> and so it's such a it's such a different way to kind of read through the bible yes, and process it and one of the things that we did for our women's ministry is because we're doing the chronological bible we read devoted Yes. Um, or we did devoted Bible study. <laughs> That's which, great. Get to uh, work through the women. Yes. yes. And which you contributed to. Yes. So tell us about who you wrote about in Devoted. I wrote about Eve. Yes. The very first. <laughs> the very first one. Very first one. And it was really fun when uh, I was asked to do that because I we had just through our women's ministry done a study in Genesis. And so mm -hmm. I'd done a deep dive, deep dive in Genesis 1 through 11. And 
saw something Mm -hmm. that I had not read in a commentary or seen before, but knowing that when you look at the book of Genesis, everything God does, we know all everything God does is not only significant, it's eternal. Right. But knowing that in the beginning he was laying the foundation and revealing himself to us. And we Mm -hmm. see that he's a God of order and Mm -hmm. that, um, everything that he was doing in creation has eternal significance. So even the way he created Adam from the dust of the earth and breathed the breath of life into him and he became a living soul. Mm -hmm. But I'm looking at thinking, okay, you spoke all these things into existence and you created the animals, but then you create Adam out of the dust. But why didn't you just do Eve the same way? Why did you take her out of his side? Uh And so I'm just thinking about this and dwelling on it and doing this study and I'm sitting out in my backyard and just I love to just sit out there and just ponder in nature, Lord, these, yes. these explain to me, I know this is extremely significant. Why mm-hmm. you created Adam first. Why Lord, why did you take Eve out of his side? And I'm telling you, Elizabeth, immediately my mind's eye went to Calvary mm-hmm. and I saw the side of Jesus pierced wow. and his blood flowing forth, purchasing his bride, yeah. the church. Oh, I love that. And to know that he was the first Adam and the yes. second Adam is the Almost one who gets the slide right here. <laughs> and to realize that everybody has to go back to that first Adam because we all get our sin nature from right. Adam. So when right. you just look at the gospel, Eve had to come out of Adam because yes. everybody goes back to Adam. And after they sinned, I'm a, I'm a complementarian mm-hmm. by biblical conviction right. as a woman mm-hmm. because God established that order before the fall. Mm-hmm. He created Adam first. He gave Adam the commands and then he created Eve out of his side mm-hmm. to complete him to be his helper. And an azer is a very strong word. Right. It's a military term. It's yes. a strong helper. It's used for God 21 times or twenty one times in the Old Testament, 16 times for God mm-hmm. as Israel's strong helper. So this is a strong word. Right. We are for you. Women, yes. w- you got a woman, <laughs> on your, a woman on your side, you, you have an ally. Right. So that is part of what it means to be an azer. And so it, it's not a weak Right. Mommy's little helper. It is a helper, a strong ally, a warrior is exactly what it is. And to, but at the same time, when they did sin, who does God come to? Adam. Adam, Mm -hmm. where are you? Yeah. Adam, where are you? And he was responsible. So we see that from the very beginning. There is male headship in the home Mm -hmm. and in the church. But other than that, a woman is free to do anything. And I challenge women all the time to be Hulda. She's one of my favorite women in scripture who lived during the time of King Josiah, because I tell women, you don't have to demand a position or a title. Anybody can serve. Right. Anybody can follow Jesus and serve. And if you will serve, God will open doors of influence and opportunity for you. He can put you before kings if he desires to. Yes. Um, And so when they needed a word from God, when they found the book of the law and they brought it to Josiah and he rent his garments Mm -hmm. and cried out and said, go get a word from the Lord. You've got the high priest, the scribe and their entourage. And where do they go? The house of Huldah, who was, her husband was probably a Levite. He was the keeper of the wardrobe. They (laughs) were aware of her, but she received a word from God. Yes. And they knew that she would have a word. All of us can be that person. Yeah. We can walk so intimately with Jesus that when people need a word from God, they know I can go to Elizabeth because she walks with Jesus. Mm. God will speak to her. Yeah. And I have always gravitated toward women who have a deep prayer life because yes. I wanted to learn from them. We learn to pray by praying with people who know how to pray. Yes. <laughs> and so I've always sought out women in the churches where we've served that are older than I was that had a just an intimate walk with mm-hmm. Jesus and ask them, can I spend time with you? May I pray with you? Um, and yeah. I think that's why I love Hulda so much because... Yeah. The high priest went to her for a word, and she had a word. God spoke to her, yes. and all of us can be that person. I love that. And I uh, that Holda was one of the women that we weren't as familiar with yeah. when we read Devoted. Um, and so people were like, oh, I didn't know that this woman. And we had some great discussions about uh, that, about sure. the, it's a woman that is carrying the word of the Lord, and That's it's right. a woman who is prophesying and these yes. kinds of things. And yes. so um, I encourage our women to pick up the devoted study because you do get to hear all the way from Eve to, um, I'm trying to think of the woman's name, Uadoa. I don't know if I'm saying that correctly, but yeah. she's in the New Testament. She's, um, I would say Yodia, but you know what? Yodia. When you go okay. to Israel, you find out you pronounce nothing right, right. anyway. <laughs> we say Nehemiah and it's Nehemiah. <laughs> 
Yes. I told somebody, I was like, you know what? They didn't have a podcast back then. We don't That's know exactly how they pronounced right. That's names. exactly right. Yes. Um, I got to write about Hagar, who is oh, now one of my favorites. Do you not just love her? I love her. And the God she, who sees. God's she first got compound name. name. Yes. yes. <laughs> and she was the first one to give him a name and that she was oh. so like unknown and yes. and just the lowest of the low, a servant and yes. Egyptian and yes. all of these things. And um, God let her give him a name. Beautiful. And he sees her. That's right. And how beautiful that is for us even today. Reminder to every woman. Yes. 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 Well, Donna, the, this is the March podcast. And so the question that we always ask is, what is one thing that has marked you in your walk with Christ? Prayer. Mm. As I mentioned, I've been drawn to people who walk with God. And, you know, when we, in college, I became, I felt called to ministry at 12. Thought okay. I'd be on the mission field. Wow. Uh, mm-hmm. Met Steve. He felt called the pastorate. I had to really wrestle through that because I had envisioned myself for years on the mm-hmm. mission field. And so began to pray. And it was evident God had brought us together and I was going to be a pastor's wife. Yeah. So in every church we've been in, I have been drawn to older women who mm-hmm. walk with the Lord. And as I have spent time with them, asked them questions and prayed with them, yes. I have found women not that just talk to God, but that God talks to, mm-hmm. like Hulda. So prayer has most marked my life. I love that. And I love how you <laughs> talked about just going to those older women and saying, can I pray with you? Well, and don't ask them to disciple you because that right. scares them to death. Right. Most <laughs> of them were never formally discipled. Yes. And they feel like they're inadequate. And that's what but I But just say, say yeah. I would like to spend time with you. May yes. I take you to lunch? I would take them to lunch and I would take my Bible and a legal pad. And I would there ask questions <laughs> and write things down and then ask to pray with them. Yes. That Sylvia Gunter, good. who mm-hmm. wrote prayer portions and several prayer ministries, mm-hmm. ended up being a mentor when we were in Birmingham. But she came to visit at our church when God was just doing some miraculous things at our church in Gardendale and she just came to check it out and I got to meet her but I had her material for a while and I was just like Sylvia Gunner's at our church and then we became friends but I would do the same thing with Sylvia it's just like oh just ask her questions and then to get to pray with her it's just oh that's such a life changing to walk with women who walk with God (laughs) Yes, and it's such a, a fruitful and yes. um, deep experience, but it's low pressure for exactly. the woman who you're exactly. talking to, and exactly. I think that's that's key. Yeah. Yes, thank you so much for being thank on you, the March podcast thank you and for, for telling us all about your Arise to Read program, thank and you. and just I feel like our listeners will know your heart for both education and the word and for God himself. And so thank you for being on here. Thank you. And thank you listeners for tuning in and we'll talk to you next week. Marked is a production of Lifeway Podcast produced by Aaron Franklin. It's recorded at the Lifeway Podcast Studio in Brentwood, Tennessee and engineered by Donnie Gordon with help from Nathan Howard. Edited by William Hall with art by Leanne Dance. And I'm your host, Elizabeth Heinemann. Meet me back here next week. If you want to join in on the conversation, you can find us on social media at Lifeway Women. Today's show notes will be posted at lifewaywomen.com slash marked. If you enjoy the show, leave us a review. Perhaps no other book of the Bible feels as inaccessible and as intimidating to us as the very last one. The book of Revelation overflows with images and ideas that confound our modern ears. Yet those who originally heard the letter understood it and drew encouragement from its message. Why is it so often not the same today? In my new 10-session study on Revelation, you'll discover how the last book of the Bible is accessible and helpful, speaking a steadying word of assurance to the church in every age. Learn more at lifeway.com slash revelation.